But first, the analysis of Shields and Brooks. That syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Welcome to both of you. Uh, where to begin? Uh, I guess we start with, David, how much the president over the last few days seems to be trying to roll back the legacy of his predecessor, President Obama. Today and yesterday, the moves on Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, the Iran nuclear deal, we've just been listening to that, the, uh, the power plan, uh, which he has said uh, he's not going to uh, uh, support the, those uh, uh, red regulations. He's going to completely undo them. Can he undo the Obama legacy? Well, uh, a lot, a lot of it. These are all campaign promises. Uh, this is what he was elected on. I'm struck by a couple things. First, he's more aggressive than just about anybody else in the administration. Whenever you hear about what's happening in the administration, it's always other people trying to restrain him. Uh, the, the Republican Party has no great clamoring to reverse the Iran deal. A lot of them opposed it at the time, but most of them, even very hawkish people, said there's no use going backwards. Let's go forwards. Uh, and so on that, he's pushing harder. On North Korea, he's more aggressive than just about anybody else in the administration. So if you're looking to see a chase in Donald Trump, uh, you're seeing quite the reverse in the last couple of weeks. What do you think, Mark? What do I think, Judy? I think that uh, the results of the Alabama primary, where Donald Trump was on the losing side with Luther Strange and Steve Bannon was on the winning side uh, with uh, Roy Moore, have, uh, are still coming in. Uh, Donald Trump since then has returned to the promises he made, uh, to the applause lines he got. Um, and uh, the, uh, the health care being a, a, a perfect example of it, um, you know, th th there is no replace. I mean, the, the, so the, the fantasy that there was a Republican health plan has been totally exposed and exploded. Um, and Donald Trump gave the final lie to that. Uh, all he wants to do now is to destroy and dismantle uh, that, which was what he can't. You know, Sam Rayburn once said, uh, any jackass can kick down a barn. It takes a good uh, carpenter to build one. And so they're just about, that's what they're about, is dismantling. When Secretary of Defense Jim Mant at Mattis, a, a decorated Marine uh, combat veteran uh, said that the, that the Iranian deal uh, in testify uh, the Senate Armed Services Committee is in the national security interest of the United States of America. And uh, Donald Trump, uh, you know, with some you know, cockamamie explanation is going to change it. Uh, you know, he's going to be playing right into the hands of the, uh, the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard. Yeah. I would just say it's not like we hear dismantle, 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 and you think it's just an act of destruction. Uh, and that was my first impulse. But then when you actually begin to look more into actually what they're doing, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, so the Iranian deal. Uh, there are two pieces of it, and the, the last discussion just reflected it very well, that the, the Iranians are keeping the nuclear peace, but there was a hope, which President Obama expressed quite often, that it would welcome Iran into the community of nations. On the contrary, they're behaving worse and using the money we gave them to arm terrorists around the world. So uh, t Donald Trump and his policy are completely right to re recognize that second piece takes a looking at. On health care, uh, they are dismantling it. There will be a period of disruption. But what was interesting to me about the CBO analysis of what's doing, after this period of disruption, there will be more people insured, not less. So it won't look like Obamacare, but as the markets respond, there's a possibility that more people will be insured. And so it's not a simple, oh, we're at just tearing things cost. apart at a higher cost. I, I, could not, I could not disagree more. More people will be insured at a, at a cheaper plan. It's a great plan if you're, if you're, uh, if you're uh, healthy and you're young, uh, just don't get sick and need medical treatment. Donald Trump promised repeatedly during the campaign, including on 60 Minutes, it would be better, cheaper, wider for everybody. You could keep your doctor. It was going to be better. It was going to happen immediately. That is untrue. Uh, you know, we, we have been in open collaboration with the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard in Syria against ISIS. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, when we talk about their money uh, given us, their mo it's their money that we unfroze. Iran's money. I mean, yeah, it wasn't. We didn't, we didn't, because uh, I just think you left the impression that we're somehow writing a check to Iran. Those were the frozen assets of Iran that, that belonged to them. I'm, I'm not defending Iranian policy, but this, this, this agreement on nuclear was in the interest of the United States that, that Iran... Only on PBS do you get ISIS and healthcare exchanges in the same paragraphs <laughs> yeah. as we talk to each other. But, it, I, I, you know, again, I, I agree with a lot of Donald Trump. Let's start with the healthcare thing. Donald Trump oversold what he's doing, and I don't agree with it. I think the exchanges were basically 
basically a moderate way to expand ins insurance coverage. But he does have, I'm just saying he has a philosophical position here. The philosophical position is that a lot of the cross-subsidization involved in these big insurance pools is unfair to a certain set of people who are, who are subsidizing the sicker and the poorer. And maybe as a society we should be doing that as a matter of social solidarity. Donald Trump does not think so. And so he's giving more people, especially small employers, a chance to pool their resources and create associations and give people insurance that way. So it is a, it is a vision. It's not just some nihilistic uh, policy here. He, he, there is some sort of vision here, more than one would expect. There's a philosophy. You're saying there's a governing philosophy there's a governing behind. Philosophy. David has just done the impossible. He has detected a coherent philosophy <laughs> in Donald Trump. Donald Trump has never explained that. Donald Trump has never been able to go before the American people, before the Congress of the United States, and say, this is why I'm doing it. And David, uh, you know, I give him great credit, the, the power of perception. Uh, You're giving insight. David the credit but of David, president. David, is, <laughs> David has found in Donald Trump what Donald Trump I'm had I'm the Trump heard. whisperer. I'm you are. You are, the, you are it. Let's talk for a moment about Puerto Rico. Uh, still a lot of conversation, David, over the last few days about whether the president is singling out Puerto Rico. Um, there were some polls done asking people whether they think Think the administration, the, the the government has done enough for Puerto Rico compared to what the government's done for, for Texas after Hurricane Harvey, for Florida after Hurricane Irma, and we're showing those numbers. Done enough, 36. Not done enough, 55 percent. The the message coming through, based on several tweets and comments by the president, is basically, you know, you Puerto Rico, you've made this mess. We'll do a little bit for you, but we're not going to be around right. forever. Be around forever. No, there's been a lack. Of, there's, well, there was total graciousness toward Texas uh, and graciousness toward Florida, but he's incapable of showing any compassion and graciousness toward people who are just trying to find drinking water in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the lesson is, is the lesson that we're all going to draw from that, that the people in Puerto Rico don't look like a, a lot of the people in Texas. And I think that's, that's probably a pretty fair uh, judgment. It's a, it's a harsh judgment, but an accurate judgment. Uh, the difference is 67 electoral votes. 38 electoral votes in Texas, 29 in Florida, none in uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, when Donald Trump went down to Puerto Rico, what was he looking for? To understand what the people were going through, the health and public safety it has it? No. He was fishing for compliments. Did they say we did a good job? Um, you know, they say we're doing a good job. Thank goodness we have a three-star general down there who said, we are here. We are here to help, and we are here for the duration. I mean, basically saying that we do have a responsibility to each other as Americans, as, as fellow human beings, and the United States government recognizes it. Yeah. And, it was and, a bit of a sign that his default position is never compassion and no, friendship. His default position is attack if you attack me. Yeah. And that, that's just characterological. And he brings it into the situations where compassion would be 99.9 percent of humanity's normal response. That's right. <laughs> well, speaking of attacks, we haven't heard as much in the last few days about his back and forth with Senator Bob Corker of Tennessee. See, they were going at hammer and tong there for a few days, Mark. Uh, but we, what we are hearing, though, and we don't know where that's going to end up, but what we are hearing is that Steve Bannon, who was the president's chief strategist, has now said that it's his mission to go after virtually every Republican in the Senate to make sure they don't get reelected. Does this except Ted good? Cruz? Well, except for Ted Cruz, mm -hmm. sorry, Texas. Who is? But, is that smart for the president uh, to have his his good friend Steve Bannon trying to do this? Is it realistic? Uh, it, it may very well be realistic based upon the Alabama returns, uh, but certainly it's certainly not helpful if you're trying to retain a majority to have a divisive and, and bitter primary for your your party's candidate. Uh, but I, I don't think it's any question. Uh, the, the, and I mentioned Ted Cruz because. Because the Mercer family, uh, who are funding uh, Steve Bannon, uh, their original presidential candidate was Ted Cruz. So Ted Cruz is exempt from this purge. Uh, but Judy, Ted, Steve Bannon doesn't have a party. He's not a Republican. Donald Trump is increasingly a man without a party. I mean, so he has he has no loyalty to the Republicans, and and he's depending upon them. As of last night. The Republicans did not have the 51 votes needed to adopt a budget next week. If they don't have the votes to have budget, you can say goodbye to any tax plan. You can say goodbye to any legislative program. The Republicans are going into 2018 because they need to pass a budget to meet the Senate rules to pass a Senate a tax bill with 51 votes. So and it, so they they it, are in terrible terrible shape. So is the answer, David, to elect more populist Republicans on the on the Republican line? 
to, to get the Senate in shape? Yeah, well, I had a chance to talk to Bannon last week, and he's t thinking on a different time frame than Donald Trump is. He's thinking in terms of centuries. It's like talking about Lenin in 1905 or something like that. He's thinking, well, we had the the, pale, the Buchanan moment, the Palin moment, Trump, that's a moment, but we're going to have a lot more moments. And he's thinking 50 years ahead, and it is to take over the Republican Party with populists. Uh, and uh, to scare John Barrasso in Wyoming, because he's like the n most normal, safest conservative Republican. And if you can scare even a Barrasso, then you can scare them all. And so he's got this world historical view of stretching out 50 years. Uh, I hope he's wrong, but he might be. He might be right. But what does that mean for right now? I mean, is that a good move for the Republican Party no. to have this kind of turmoil? No, not for Donald Trump in the short term. Bannon's playing a long game where he thinks if I can just, he, he already picked off one. If you can pick off one or two more Republicans, uh, that are sitting Republicans, then he'll effectively control them all. They're, they're terrified, uh, Judy, if you're, you're sitting in a district where the Republican primary voters are 45, 50, 60 percent Trump partisans and zealots, uh, you're scared stiff of alienating in any way Steve Bannon or, or Donald Trump. So they're, 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 there's a paralysis of fear that grips Republican, especially in the House. You got a safe Republican district, that means that the majority of the voters in your district, in the primary, are overwhelmingly supporters of President Trump. But so, in that way, it sort of is effective for him because nobody likes, nobody in Congress likes Trump. No. <laughs> nobody, there's no relationship. None. So he governs by fear, and it's not necessarily fear of Trump, but it's fear of his base, mm -hmm. and that's how he's governing. And maybe the more more Roy Moores there are, there are more fear that will be, and he'll he will have some party discipline that way. That's All right. He's right. So we've uh, all right. Wait yeah. a minute. You I mean, said one, he's one right. Before, isn't Earlier, you said <laughs> <laughs> better than the Nationals. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're in mourning. All right. <laughs> Mark Shields, David Brooks. Thank you both. <laughs>